So before I get started, I do I would love to know like what what demographics we have in the room right now. So um, if you are a foster parent or caregiver and that's what brought you here primarily today, can I see some hands? Okay, one, nice. Um, if you are a professional that works with kids directly. If you're in child protection or social work, awesome. Okay, am I missing anything? Anyone want to speak? Well, nursing. nursing. Awesome. Perfect. So <clears throat> it's just helpful for me as I share stories and I know who's in the audience and, and who's going to connect with what and who might not. So, yeah. Okay. Is this on? All right, so I'm Galen Elmore. I'm really excited to be here with you, and I, I want to start by uh, letting you know why I talk about belonging in the way that I do. And it really comes from this early question I got in life, and I continue to get through at various points in my life, and they would, the question would be something like this. Galen, how did you do it? How did you do it? How are you successful? How are you so polite and... Okay, it's good. Yep, I have a black screen up there. So, so we are good. Thank you. Okay, we want to move that off. Okay. How are you so respectful? How are you so educated? How, how did you do it? Because you went through a lot of hard things in life. And I always hated that question. I hated it, not because uh, it felt uh, presumptuous or it felt any like wrong in any way. I just, I didn't know how to answer ever. I never knew how to answer it. And so there was this realization, this epiphany, if you will, that I had early in my 20s when I learned about this thing called belonging. And when I read about it, I actually heard about belonging in, uh, as someone was referring to it in the discipline of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they were like, DEIB, belonging is something that we're adding to it. And I was like, okay, what is, what is this like, psychology of belonging? What is that? And so I started to learn more about it, and it was this eye-opening moment. Because the answer that I don't know to that question is not sufficient. You wouldn't ask that question. Show of hands, be honest, be bold. Have you ever asked someone that question that went through hard things? Yeah? Have you been asked that question before? Yeah, and it's a tough question to ask, or to, it's hard to ask, but it's even harder to answer. And so for me, belonging was like this epiphany of, I know what I will say from here on out. And really, belonging is, um, it's, it's not this really, it's not as evasive or unclear as we like to think it might be. Really belonging, and social psychologist Greg Walton says, belonging is allowing someone to remove bad things from happening from their identity, from who they are. So now when I go through hard things or I go through challenges or I experience adversity, it's no longer a reflection of my identity, Galen, I'm just bad, I don't deserve anything good, and so that's why I go through hard things. It's more so that's what happens in life, and everyone goes through hard things. Mine just might look a little bit different or it might be as a little bit easy, easier to notice on the surface level, right? Because there's a lot of bad things we go through in this room that we can hide, that we can go about life as normal and people won't know. But when you're a kid and you show up at school and you are, you're a black kid, you, wear, uh, you connect with black culture and you have a Caucasian foster parent, people are gonna ask questions. Or if you are in second grade and your, your caregiver is elderly, you're gonna get a lot of questions. And so there are things about my life that I just couldn't hide the hard things that I went through, especially as a kid. And so um, I know we're here talking about the, the early years of development. And I wanna share with you a story that I think shows the contrast of my life. And Yesterday we had Dr. Tina Bryson and she was able to talk about 
the importance of parenting and attachment and how it influences children. And I'm really here to be the bearer of bad news, right? I'm here to show you and kind of talk about what can happen when it's not done right. But as we close my time today and, and we transition into Dr. Sege, we're gonna talk about what happens with the positive experiences, how that can counteract the previously bad. And so I wanna, I wanna share with you two stories as I open up that, that really compare and contrast like the, the good and bad in relation to the trauma that I experienced. So I was a mama's boy. I know it's hard to believe I'm a tall, bearded, like large individual, but I was, at one point, I was this cute, big headed little kid that was a mama's boy. <laughs> I know you're laughing because I still have a big head, but I grew into it. <laughs> so, so it's okay, I grew into it. They told me I would, it took a couple decades, but I did. And I was a mama's boy, and there was this time where um, I was going to daycare while my sisters were at school. My mom, she was a hairdresser by trade. My dad worked in factories. And am I able to move further? Is that okay with camera stuff? Um, my, my mom worked at uh, the Walmart like hair, hair salon, and she did hair. And so I would be at daycare when my sisters were at school, and then they'd join after. And so there was, there was something good about being alone in certain places without my sisters. I had older sisters, they were, they were annoying. <laughs> they were, it seemed like their goal in life was to make sure that I didn't have a good time. <laughs> and so when I didn't, when I wasn't with them, it was great. I was living my best life, quote unquote. And I was at daycare one day and there for lunch, there was broccoli. <laughs> now, the reason I say broccoli is, is not because I'm just a traditional kid that doesn't like broccoli. I hated broccoli. <laughs> I hated it. There was not a time in my life up until that point where I had eaten broccoli and didn't throw up. Not a single time. I couldn't keep it down. It was not just this, I'm, uh, I'm, being, I'm defiant against uh, authority. I, I just literally could not eat it. And my, my daycare providers, I was sitting at lunch and they served broccoli and I was like, I can't eat broccoli. And they're like, and we're in the 90s. So they're like, Galen, either you eat broccoli or you don't, but if you don't, you're not going outside with everyone else. And I was a really hyperactive kid. I loved competition. Like I, I got through the day so I could go outside. Like otherwise there was no point. And so I'm sitting there contemplating it and I'm like, there's no way I'm about to eat this broccoli. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and minutes are going by and I'm looking outside and kids are starting to go outside because they finished their food and they're having fun. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can eat it. I'm gonna try to fight it down. Just, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna hold my nose, not gonna like smell it, I'm just gonna eat it and go outside as fast as I can. So eventually I get the courage to do that. I take a couple steps towards outside and it all comes back up. Now I'm sorry for those that you're eating. I'm, I didn't ask to be the one right after breakfast, I'm, I'm just saying, but it all came back up. And then my daycare providers are like, we have, to call, we have to call home because you just threw up. So you need to, we're, you're, like, you're gonna have to get your stuff and go home. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, I told you that I would get sick and I couldn't eat it. Like, you, you basically made me eat it. And they're like, well, our policy, you gotta go home. So they call my mom, who's at work, to come pick me up. And if you know anything about, I mean, it's not even a socioeconomic thing. Going, leaving work to go get your kid for daycare, which you are already paying for, is awful. Like the pandemic ruined daycare like as, an, as, as a parent for me because it was just like, I'm paying you anyway. I'm paying you to watch, like I'm watching my own children and I'm paying you to do it. So like I, I now have a different perspective about the frustration my mom had coming to pick me up. And so she came and picked me up and she's asking like what happened. It's like, oh, and she's trying to console me and like, Galen, are you okay? What's, what's wrong? And I'm, I am, excuse my language, I'm pissed. <laughs> I am upset because not only did I tell him I didn't want to eat broccoli, I ate it and I got sick because I ate it. And it was just a bunch of losses really early in the day. And so I wasn't talking to my mom. I was like, I'm not, going, I'm not talking, I'm, I'm upset. Eventually we get into the car and we're in the 90s. So my mom helps me in the front seat and I get in the front seat. <laughs> I get in the front seat and I'm still not talking to my mom. And she's like begging and please, she's like, baby, what's, like, tell me what's wrong. And eventually 
the floodgates come out. And I just tell her everything. I was like, I told them I didn't want to eat broccoli. They made me eat broccoli so I could go outside. And then I got sick and they told me how to go home. And my mom like was pulling out of our parking spot. She slammed on her brake. She put the car in park. She didn't pull back into the parking spot. She's like, she got out, she got me and we went back in. And my mom for 10 plus minutes just let them have it. Just was screaming, cussing, was like, and then she, she eventually, like, they were like, okay, okay, we'll keep them. Like, we'll keep them, like, let it go. And my mom was like, nope, I'm not letting him stay here anyway. And then grabbed me and took, we went back in the car. She buckled me in. She was like, you wanna go get ice cream? I was like, yes. And we drove off. And I kid you not, that is the proudest moment from my childhood. It is the proudest moment of my childhood. I'm someone who, I've, we did the, the body map of different emotions uh, yesterday during your session, uh, Townley, and I'm someone that I feel all positive emotions in my stomach. I, there's just this, this tangible feeling, and I feel it really, like it's like, a, it's like a tingling feeling in my stomach, and there's only a few times in life where I've ever felt that, and that was one of them. Now, comparing it, to now or now as an adult, I have very little to, if any, attachment to my own biological mom. And there are things that happened throughout my childhood that led to that. And so, I, when we're talking about the positive or being the difference or being a positive difference, the belonging difference today, to me, in my opinion, it's really the difference between falling to your circumstances or rising to your potential. Right, if we wanna talk about anyone in here starting a new job, Belonging in your workplace will be the difference between you falling to circumstance of like, maybe I wasn't trained very well, maybe I don't have adequate resources, maybe um, I'm not in my like, line of work that I'm normally comfortable with, familiar with, it's kind of stretching me. The difference between you falling to circumstance and rising to potential within that job is belonging for you. How are people meeting you where you are? How are people giving you adequate support, necessary resources in order to succeed? The same thing is true for kids. The same thing is true as people are navigating hard, difficult, traumatic things, change. The difference between falling in circumstance, rising in potential is belonging. And that thing is true for me. Spoiler alert, at 16, I made the decision that I was gonna drop out of high school. Made the decision that I was going to drop out of high school. What led to that decision, I was sitting in geometry class and, oh yeah, I should probably get to the slides here. So this is me as a, a, as a sophomore in high school. I was gonna, I made the decision to drop out. I was sitting in my geometry class, Mr. Erickson, and I was very uncomfortably sitting in a desk. And it wasn't because something was going on in my body and I couldn't sit still, it was because I was just too big for desks. It just, desks are not made for six foot four sophomores. Just not a thing. So I was sitting uncomfortably in class. They called down there like, Galen, we need you to come to the office. And so as I walk in the hallway, I'm, starting, I'm trying to think of what did I do to get in trouble? Now, I've been a frequent flyer two times in my life. Now as a professional and as a kid going to the office in, in school. I was a frequent flyer. I had gold medallion status. I got, I got, got some perks. I had my own little desk in the office. I, like, I, I got some perks that other people didn't have. So as I'm going down to the office, I'm like, what did I do to get sent here? Like, what have I done? I was like, okay, I didn't skip class this week. I'm good there, check that off the list. I didn't argue toe to toe with Mr. Lindenberg this week. That's, I have his class next period, so that's coming up. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I did say a really questionable joke in Miss Wilson's biology class. But she likes me, so she's not gonna tell me. I'm not in trouble for that. Like, we have rapport, we're good. I go down to the office and I walk into the conference room, which is where they directed me, which is not normal. I get, go down to the conference room and the superintendent, principal, athletic director, high school coach, football coach, basketball coach, all school counselors in the conference room. And I walk in and I'm like, Miss Wilson didn't like my joke. <laughs> I don't know what I said, but she didn't like it. And I sit down and much to my surprise, their first question is about my dad. They're like, Galen, have you seen or spoken to your dad? Without thinking about it. like total biological response, yes. But that was a lie. I hadn't seen or heard from my dad in three days. 
I was going about life as normal. I was not going to tell anyone. There was experiences in my past where I didn't trust externally. I was not going to trust that someone had my best interests at heart. So I wasn't telling anyone. They tell me, Galen, we know that's not true. We got a call from the county uh, jail. Your dad was arrested and booked Friday night. We need to find a place for you to go. I had grown up in foster care for the most part. I was not going back after I got out. My dad got, me, got custody of me again when I was 13 years old. When I got out of foster care at 13, I was like, I am never going back. And so I walked out of that office that day committed to dropping out. Because it was like, you know what? I'm going to get emancipated. I'll start my future. I don't want to put my hope and dreams in someone else's hands. Now, we know contextually, what hopes and dreams am I really protecting by dropping out? I'm kind of throwing a lot of them away. But I made that decision. Despite that decision, I'm here today. I'm, I graduated high school early and with honors. I became a uh, college recruit for football and basketball. I signed an NFL contract. I get to do this, like, despite all of that, I'm here. And I'm not saying that to, like, kudos me, pat me on the back. I'm saying that because it had a lot more to do with people like you in this room than it ever did me. The belonging that people provided, despite over 10 years in the foster care system, over five years of severe abuse and neglect, over 20 different foster homes, living in three different states, going to six different K through 12 schools, despite all of that, I was able to quote unquote make it. And a lot of times when people are asking that question, Galen, how did you do it? It's because they want to hear something that I have this secret insight into that they don't know. This little secret to success that I'm gatekeeping. But it's, it had way more to do with the people around me than it ever did me. But as a 16 year old, I can't, I don't know how to communicate that to people. I don't even understand the importance of the people in my life because I wasn't, I wasn't willing to let people in still. And so the thing that allowed me to do that is belonging. And there's this definition of belonging that I love from Carl Rogers, where I think it, it breaks it down really tangibly and in a way that we can digest. And the three ways are yearning for connection. So this yearning for connection is this subconscious, innate, fundamental human need. It's not a conscious decision. Neuroscience has, sh has shown us that the same neural pathways that communicate hunger and thirst communicate lack of belonging. The same neural pathways that communicate hunger and thirst communicate lack of belonging. When's the last time you had to remind yourself to breathe? When's the last time you had to remind yourself that, oh man, I, I should probably get some food? Now, if you're telling you may have those moments, <laughs> but the reality is our body is communicating to us way before we ever communicate to our body that we need those needs met. And if you're waiting, until you are communicating it to your body, more likely than not, it's an unhealthy decision. It's an unhealthy response. It's beyond the point of like, being beneficial in that moment. And the same thing is true for belonging. It's important for us to see belonging as this subconscious, innate part of who we are instead of seeing it as a conscious decision. Because if we see it as a conscious decision, we can disqualify certain people's needs or rights to belong. The second part is a need for positive regard. We all need to know that there are people out there that care about what happens to us, care about our well-being, beyond what we can do or provide for them. As a kid going through the foster care system, a need for positive regard felt foreign. Me not being where I was supposed to be didn't, it didn't raise red flags. It's just like, ah, Galen being Galen. If you have some, a serious traumatic event happening in your life right now, and you can't go to work for two weeks, a month, two months, and you walk back into the office, and let's say you work your first five, and Townley's like, where's that report we asked for? We know this isn't true. <laughs> but where's that report that we asked for before there's ever a conversation about how you're doing? You are going to know that my need for positive regard will not be met here, and you're going to question how long you want to continue to work there. 
Now, we know that's not true. That's, that's not a real situation. First five, don't use me as an excuse next time you walk into the office. <laughs> but my, so my wife, her profession, her career is in talent acquisition. And there's something called the great resignation right now. And it's, the, it's uh, referring to the high rate that people are resigning from their work and their jobs. And the reason that they found that this is happening is because the pandemic has been this uni unifying or unilateral traumatic event for everybody. It's forced us to rethink the way that we do work. It's forced us to challenge like, okay, what do I value in a workplace? And if you're gonna force me to drive into the office before anyone else is driving into the office, I'm gonna question that you care about me as a person. And so if I'm gonna question that you care about me as a person, your money isn't enough for me anymore. I'm gonna go somewhere else. So if the need for positive regard is removed, you might not work where you work. You might not live where you live. The same thing is true for the kids that we're talking about. They need to know that there are people out there that care about what happens to them beyond what they do for you, beyond how easy they are to deal with, beyond how well they're listening or how good they are at listening, uh, compliance, whatever it is, they need to know that you care about them. That even though Galen might, are there any teachers in the room? My people, no, just kidding. Everyone's my people, but. Before, before a student is really able to feel like they belong in your classroom, they need to know that if I got kicked out yesterday, when I come back today, it's all going to be okay. Like, I'm, I still have another shot. That matters. Desire for personal connection. We all have a desire to be known on a one-on-one -on -one intimate level with some relationships in our life. The reason this is important is because then we don't have to explain all the decisions we make and why we make them. Again, me as a kid, I had no, no rationale for why I made the decision I, ma I made. I just made them. I was just, I trusted my gut and I was like, you know what, this is how I'm gonna respond to this situation. We all need to have people in our life that, kind, that know the ins and outs about us and why we show up in the ways that we do. So if I'm a kid, I use this example with, not a kid, but in a relationship with my wife. In our dating phase, if I had to continue to explain to her, I have issues or I'm triggered in these situations because of the trauma I experienced in my past, time and time and time and time again, I'm eventually gonna give up on that relationship. Because there's an aspect of, there's no desire for personal connection there. You don't, you don't care enough about me to know me and what makes me me. Now that doesn't give people um, excuses to stay the same, to operate in their, their triggers or their trauma. But there's something that you need to show commitment that I care about this person enough to know them on an intimate level. So I don't just hold them to the same criteria as, as the person next to them because we're all unique and different individuals. Kids need to know that you are willing to be in their life long enough to know them intimately. To know them on a deep level so that they can belong and so that they can succeed. If we want to oversimplify it, it's knowing that I'm important, that I matter, that I have value. Every single child, every single human wants to know that they're important, that they matter, that they have value. Now as a kid, these things weren't growing on trees for me. They just weren't there. A lot of things that I had to navigate, these things felt like the opposite of them felt true. Felt like I didn't matter. Felt like I wasn't important to anybody. It didn't, me being where I was supposed to be didn't move the needle for anyone. There was, um, so for me, I, I told you about the story of, of daycare and, and the broccoli situation. The reason I tell you about that is because there was, the, the first time I got abused in, in my foster home when I was six years old was because I didn't eat broccoli. So we're, we're a couple years after the fact, I'm in a new foster home um, and one of the, within the first three days, we have a broccoli casserole for dinner. And I'm sitting there, like, I locked eyes with the broccoli, and I was just like, we meet again. We meet again. You won last time, you're not winning this time. And so I sat at the table, committed, I was like, I'm not eating this thing. I won't. I know what happened last time. I'm not doing it, you're not getting me. Fool me once. You're not getting me again. So I sat there defiantly and was like, I'm not eating this. My foster parent, who was new, or we were, our relationship was new, was like, you're gonna sit there until you eat it or until I say go to bed. 
So I sat there for hours. All the other kids doing their chores, cleaning up, eating their food, going to bed, and I'm sitting there. Lights, only kitchen light on is the one over the sink. And I'm just sitting there like, hmm. Eventually I, I got the, the, the go ahead to go to sleep, which we already know that that's a problematic situation. I got the go ahead to go to sleep and I go to bed and I have this weird sensation in the middle of the night for the first time in my life. I woke up with hunger pains. Woke up with hunger pains. Now, in my family, like when I was home, I ate whenever I wanted to eat. I had no understanding of like, there was like food that was okay, there was a window that you could eat, like we were in intermittent fasting, like I didn't know that. <laughs> and so I got up, like kind of this half sleep, and I didn't, I didn't realize what I did until the next morning, but kind of woke up, went to the cupboard, got some food, went back to sleep. Well, I was awoken by my foster parent. She had a belt in her hand. And she was like, you just got here and you're already still in food. She was like, get up, get dressed for school and meet me upstairs. I start getting dressed. I eventually see the, the uh, digital clock on, on the dresser. It's a little bit after five o'clock. So I get dressed, I go upstairs and uh, she basically just says, Galen, you're gonna stand in that corner on one leg and I'm gonna sit behind you. And if you fall over, if you switch feet, if you lean against the wall, if you do anything without my permission, I'll be right here waiting to catch you. And I stood there for three hours that morning. Eventually, school came around, I had to go to school. I leave the house and, and I'm in this home with my biological, two of my biological sisters and there are other kids in the home too, but I immediately seek them out because they were a place of belonging for me. So I immediately seek them out, try to get some affection. They had been in this home already. I'm new, so I'm trying to like make sense of everything that's happening. And I go to them and I'm kind of stiff armed by my older sister. And that was like, that was to use a scientific term, dysregulating for me, right? Because my sister, if you know anything about kids within the system, my sister was a mom figure for me. She was a place of comfort. And so I go to her and she's like, you need to get your stuff together. And I'm like, what do you mean? She was like, if you don't, you're gonna make it harder on the rest of us. And so it created this oppositional experience in a home that was already unsafe. It was a zero sum game. That we all can't be safe, that if one person is under fire, then it, everyone loses and we need to make sure that we don't step on each other's toes. I stayed in that home for almost five years, or almost six years. From six until I was 12, I was in that home. I, I had abusive encounters for oversleeping, missing the bus, uh, being accused of eating my toothpaste, getting called home from school, falling asleep in church, um, using up the hot water in the house, the last bit of the hot water, anything under the sun I got in trouble for. But there were positive experiences along that way that made a difference, that stopped those things from being my, my destiny, right? We talked yesterday about our history is not our destiny. Without positive experiences, there's a chance that it might become our destiny, right? And so for me, there were positive experiences that, that really made a difference in that season of life and as life continued to be hard. I got out of that home when I was going into sixth grade because me and my sister ran away. We ran away and we were, I was 11, she was 14, we were gone for over a month on our own, couch hopping, we had prepared, because we had ran away before unsuccessfully, and so we were preparing for a time that we would do it again. And we were gone for over a month. After running out of places to stay, we decided to turn ourselves in. Luckily, that launched an investigation. My sister, who was adopted by this person, her adoption was terminated. My adoption was pending as my dad was fighting it in the, in the state Supreme Court, and all of it was terminated, they lost their license, we were all split up, sent out of the home. Within a year, I was back with my dad. Within a year. I hadn't lived with him since I was four, so I was almost 13 years old, living with my dad, and we are strangers. Right away, we struggle financially, right away. We're financially insecure. Um, we struggled to keep our heat and electricity on those first years, or that first year. We eventually moved to a different uh, state. We moved to Wisconsin, and eighth grade, my dad relapsed, stopped taking his mental, or uh, his, uh, 
his mental health like uh, medication, depression medication, and relapsed, started using, we became homeless halfway through my eighth grade year. That homelessness carried over to my freshman year of high school. Sophomore year, we finally got stable. So my sophomore year of high school, which is where I told you that story of my dad getting arrested, was the first time since fifth and sixth grade that I returned to the same school for the second year in a row. First time, so sixth grade I was in that school, seventh grade new school, eighth grade new school, ninth grade new school. Sophomore year is the first time I had some semblance of stability. Then my dad got arrested. So, how do we provide belonging? Through this thing I called CARE. Now, I'm not an overly simplistic person, so stick with me. CARE is an acronym. CARE is something, if I want to be punny, dare I say, characteristics that we might have in order to provide belonging. So these are four commitments that I think each and every one of us can make that I, that I know are backed behind science of the difference we can make in how we can provide belonging to kids that are going through hard things, which does not have to be the same thing. Hard is challenging is subjective. So if you look over there, I'm going to give you the answers to the test. <laughs> CARE acronym is right there. So this is big headed old me. Um, see, I had a big hit. People, it's funny because I don't get awes when I show my picture, but when my daughter who has the same head as I do gets up there, everyone's like, aww. And I'm starting to take it personal. I'm just letting you know. So next time you see pictures of me, I, I want to hear a collective, aww. I didn't show anything new yet. Thank you though. Um, so yes, there was... I told you a little bit, there's, a, there's uh, about my abusive relationship, not relationship, but uh, guardian when I was in the foster care system. So one of the hardest things that I, I had to navigate when it came to abuse was oversleeping and, and missing the bus. The reason it was the most difficult or challenging to navigate is because I didn't know the direct outcome of doing that. It wasn't consistent. It was all over the place. Like there were times where People were legitimately sick, overslept, missed the bus, but didn't tell bef like our foster parent beforehand that they were sick and they got in a ton of trouble. There were times where you overslept and missed the bus and our foster parent would take you to the McDonald's drive-thru and you get dropped off at school like it was your birthday. Like it was a really, ran like just a wide spectrum of things that could happen. But another reason it was really hard to navigate was because you didn't get to go to school for that day. You'd be the only kid at home be the only kid with our abuser, which she worked third shift as a nurse. Um, and so, sorry. Um, <laughs> and so she would be home all day and it would just be you. So if she was having a bad day, you would be the recipient of the bad day. And then school was a safe space. It was where I felt like I could actually go and be me. And so losing out on that opportunity because of decisions I made, which I was holding myself responsible. It was like, why did I oversleep? I shouldn't have hit snooze and so on and so forth. So there's a time, excuse me, when I was in fourth grade that I decided to walk to school instead of telling my abuser. I wake up a little bit after nine o'clock and our, I knew, because I was a frequent flyer to the office, knew that 12.30 was when they made calls home for inexcused absences. And I was like, well, I know Miss Taylor at 12.30, she's gonna go alphabetically. I'm in Elmore, so it doesn't give me a ton of time, but I probably got to like 12.40 where they, they're gonna call home. I was like, cool. It takes me on the bus like 40 minutes to get to school. Easy. I'll be there in no time. We know that's not true, right? <laughs> so this is also a time where Apple Maps, Google Maps don't exist. We don't have smartphones. Kids definitely don't have smartphones. Uh, it was, it was the, the Blackberry time of our culture. <laughs> and I didn't, I mean, I had, if anything, I had a track phone with minutes, maybe. Only so I could play Snake on it when I was bored. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I got, I got some, some family over here, people that know what I'm talking about. Um, and so in order to get directions from, like to, from point A to point B, you'd have to go into the computer room, you have to turn on the dial-up modem, and you would have to print off directions from MapsQuest. We know that's not quick, and we know that's not quiet. <laughs> right? That's the opposite of those two things. So I left the house, and I was like, I'm going to walk my bus route. Walking your bus route is not the fastest way from point A to point B either. So, I got to school 10 minutes before the 3 o'clock bell. Oh 
It had taken me almost six hours to walk to school. I've since looked it up in straight shot. It's 5.7 miles. Straight shot. I did not walk straight shot. I got to school and basically I had to call home to my foster parent. I got right back on the bus and went home to the worst abusive encounter I had. But there was something about that experience that was different. So when I walked into the office, all the lead teachers in the whole school were there. All of them. And that was like, like alarm going off number one. It's like, why is everyone in here? And when I walked into the office, they all rushed me. And they started to hug me and kiss me. And some were crying, some were upset. And I was, it was really confusing for, for fourth grade me, right? It's like, Miss Scarlett, you just sent me to the office a week ago. Why are you crying? Right? You just sent me to the office. So I know we're not that close. <clears throat> but there was this response. There was this emotion in the room that I didn't understand right away. And then I caught a glimpse of the clock on the back wall, similar to that one. And I realized what time it was. And then I heard my teacher say, like, one of my teachers shook me. I was like, Galen, what were you thinking? The, like, we were scared death, worried sick. Police have been out looking for you for the last three hours. And so I'm like, oh, man, I am in serious trouble. So the police were out looking for me. And I, as I sat there for the 10 minutes before they sent me to the bus so I could go home, there were like some other realizations that started to come. And so there was one of my teachers uh, who I, I wasn't in her class anymore, but I had previously confided in her about some of the abusive things that I was going through. She kind of sounded the alarm. She mandated, reported it. Some things, interview happened, nothing came of it. But she was like, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm the one that called the cops. And I was like, why? I don't understand why you're apologizing. And she was like, well, because when I called home, where when they called home, your foster parents said you weren't there. I thought she did something really bad to harm you. So I called the police. And they told me not to, but and I'm, it might get you in more trouble, but I'm, I'm sorry, I had to. And that's the first time in my life that someone called the police because they were worried about me. Because they were genuinely concerned that something bad had happened to me. Every other time, running away, getting in trouble, police had been calling me because I was a, a problem child, because I was a criminal. There have been times where I'd been like found as a runaway by police and I'd, I was zip tied and put in the back of a padded wagon. And so this time, someone called out of concern. And so that was like, okay, that's a big deal. But then like when I got on the bus, normally going home to the abuse was the hardest, like the hardest thing. If I got in trouble at school, the anticipation of what was waiting for me was, was really, really bad. But I got on the bus and my sister, who everyone in the school knew that Galen was missing. Everyone knew, because people were being pulled out of class, asked like, have you talked to him? Do you know where he's at? Like, it was chaos. And my sister got on the bus, she was like, Galen, you okay? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, you sure? And she wasn't asking because she was concerned. She was asking because she knew what was about to happen when we got home. But I was okay. I wasn't frozen in fear. I wasn't t in terror because I knew I would go home and what, it, what would be would be. But I got to go to school the next day. And they couldn't legally keep me away from school. I would have to come back. And the, the emotion, the connection that happened when I walked into that office that day was something I'll never forget. Because there were people in there who legally weren't required to care about me that did. I walked away from that office that day committed knowing I'm going to give this school everything I can. I would never do anything in my life to jeopardize being in one of their classrooms because of this feeling that I don't understand, but I feel right now. So the first part of care is compassion. Compassion is not empathy. Compassion is not just feelings that we feel when we sit in bad things with people. Compassion is us being driven into action on behalf of others. Those same feelings that, that you might be an empathetic person with are driving you into action to alleviate the experience of someone else in whatever way that they might need in that moment. My teachers communicated so much compassion in that office that day. Something that was so profound for me and that they might have done for any kid that was in that situation. But for me, it changed something in my, in my mental experience. It was a positive experience that was happening in the middle of an awful experience that transformed it all for me in the moment. 
And that's what happens when we show up and we provide belonging and we care. We can do that same thing in the midst of something hard that changes the experience in that moment, but also in the future. To a point where like, I develop relationships in that school where I will champion, I will, I, like, I will be connected to those people for the rest of my life. Compassion is so important, so what are you doing in order to be driven into action on the behalf of other people? What are you doing that may be overstepping like bureaucracy, policy, procedure in order to make a difference in the lives of someone else? What are you doing to take that next step? That's compassion. Compassion isn't always easy. Sometimes it's simple, straightforward. This is what it looks like. But when it gets hard, how are you doing that? When the, the, the pathway isn't as clear or as easy to navigate, how are you showing up with compassion? Because for, for me, what unified bad experiences with, with adults and relationships in my life is that at some point they weren't willing to be compassionate any, anymore. That's what it felt like for me. So when I got a new caseworker, when someone moved me from different foster homes, when my parents didn't show up to, um, to a, a family visitation, or my parents testified in court to terminate their parental rights voluntarily, they weren't willing to be compassionate anymore for whatever reason. That's how I understood it. And so a way that you can be the difference is simply by being compassionate people consistently. The next story stays in that same school. Um, there was a janitor in that school, and her name was Miss Peanut. Anyone want to take a guess why her name is Miss Peanut? Sure. She was four foot two. <laughs> World's shortest janitor. In, in first grade, I was taller than her. I would literally put my, like, I would put my, my hand on her shoulder if we were standing next to each other. Miss Peanut was so cool. So Miss Peanut lived in our neighborhood, and we know that custodians don't get a, a glamorous rep. They're not people of esteem or authority in our society, unfortunately. We look down on that role. No, like kids don't grow up like, I wanna be a custodian. And if your kid says that, you're like, no, you don't, <laughs> right? That's how we respond to custodians. And so Miss Peanut lived in our neighborhood. She had seen kids in our home go through that school before, she knew my foster parent. She knew the real foster parent. She didn't get the facade and the mask that everyone else got. She got the real version. So she got treated with disrespect. She got disregarded, dismissed, treated in similar ways that we did. So she, she saw her for what she was. And she, forced, like, she used that <clears throat> to respond to us in unique ways in the school building. And so I kind of shared a, a couple different stories, but I had a tough relationship with, um, with food as a kid. Still do in, in a lot of ways, but I was also on free and reduced lunch. So if there was something in the free and reduced lunch that I didn't eat, I was SOL. I, there were no other backup options. So I'm, one day I'm sitting in the lunchroom, there's broccoli like for lunch, like in the main course. If it touches anything, I'm not touching it. Like I walk into a restaurant and smell broccoli, I'm like, ah, I don't know if I'm gonna eat here. Seriously, so like there was one day I was like, I'm not eating and I'm sitting there just stewing, like literally festering on what I was experiencing. And all my friends eating their from home lunch, they're getting the food that their parents put in their lunchbox and, or the money that they put in their lunchbox and going to the back, buying extra treats, eating everything in front of me. Like kids, kids aren't aware, right? They're just like chomping down, spitting as they're talking to me. Like I'm just sitting there stewing. Miss Peanut walks in, she doesn't even acknowledge me. She goes to the back, she goes with the lunch ladies, comes back out, has a handful of snacks, drops them in front of me and just keeps walking. <laughs> and they all looked at me like, what'd you do to get that? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, can I have some? I'm like, no, <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't give me anything of yours. <laughs> But there is, that is one example of ways that Miss Peanut just made a tremendous impact on me and changed my perspective about accepting help from people. There are other times where, again, I'm being vulnerable here and transparent, where I was in the office and other times and she'd walk through and she'd like see me at the corner of her eye and she'd like, hey, what are you doing in here? I'm like, Miss Peanut, what happened? Well, she's like, no, no, no. You're better than that, you know better. Like, be better. And she would hold me accountable in certain ways. 
But there is something about Miss Peanut that she will forever be cemented in my memory of positive experiences. And she never had me in her home. She never was the leader of a class that I was in. She was never this prominent figure in my experience, but it didn't matter. And so there's a lot of people, regardless of your work, you might disqualify yourself in the way that you can provide positive experiences for children. You might disqualify yourself. Oh, I don't have the training. Oh, I don't have the access to them. They're not, I don't, I'm, I'm just a teacher's aide. I don't get to do this. I'm only a nurse, like all these things. But the reality is, how authentic are you willing to be about your role? What does authenticity, authenticity look like for you? It refers to the proven fact that something is legitimate or real. There's a lot of kids in life who adults, prominent figures in their experience, overpromise and underdeliver. They say all this is about to happen and can't follow through. And now the kid doesn't need to know that, oh, something came up in, in, the, in, in my job and they changed me off your caseload. They don't need to know that. They will never know that. But what they know is you, just like everyone else, gave up. You stopped showing up. You didn't make an impact where you said you might. And so we have to be authentic to what we can do. We have to be authentic. Maybe your role is, is your director and you're supposed to support, support your staff. How can you authentically do that so they can make the difference directly? You don't have to be connected specifically with children in order to make a difference. There's something authentic to you where you can do that. The next story I want to talk about is my high school counselor. So when I got, when I got uh, my dad got arrested, they changed my schedule my high school counselor changed my schedule so that I would come down to their office and talk to them every day. I didn't like talking. Not about feelings. Not about hard things that I was going through. And so I'd go there and I would literally sit in silence. And then there were days that I was like, you know what, I'm going to try to like, make them upset. I'm going to try to push them away so that they stop bringing me here. I'm going to cuss them out, make fun of their their job, I'm gonna research, and I was, I was this good at it. I would research salaries for high school counselors and like make fun of their salary. And it's like, you're really gonna spend your time in this office being made fun of by a 16 year old kid and you're just gonna do that every day? I'm like, no, you're gonna give up at some point. So I continue to do this. And so my sophomore year ended, I came back, got my schedule for my junior year. In eighth hour, I had to go to the counselor's office. And I'm like, these women will not quit. <laughs> like, what is up? And then one day they brought me in. They didn't say anything. They were like, Galen, we want you to read our computer. And I sat down and I read it and it was this thing called reactive attachment disorder. And it was the first time that I started to get language to explain what was happening internally with primary relationships in my life. And I felt vulnerable, naked, and like that they knew something about me that I didn't know about myself in that moment. But it, it sparked some curiosity in me. And so when they asked me questions that day, I answered them. And then much to my surprise, I was like, I'm not just gonna like combust because I'm being vulnerable right now. Like that, I literally was like, I'm going to literally die if I tell people about what, what has happened in my life and my feelings and emotions related to them. But I started to do it and it didn't, I didn't blow up. I was like, okay, this ain't that bad. It's not that scary. And these counselors who I tried everything in my power to push away, to push their buttons, to make them upset at me, I tried everything in my power. They got the ball rolling with me being able to identify what was happening in my brain and my body. They were the, they were the genesis of my healing process. And it was not because they were so much more gifted or special than anybody else. It was because they were resilient. We talk about resilience in relation to kids all the time. We want kids to be resilient. But if I had a dollar for every time someone told me I was resilient, I'd be able to live in California. <laughs> but I can't. Because I didn't get a dollar every single time. But it got annoying. It was up there as a top two annoying, like, statement question as like, how did you go through, how did you get through it? How did you do it? And it's because resilience is like this, it can be weaponized. It feels like, oh, like, you're, you're gonna pick yourself up by your bootstraps and get through this, Galen, because you're resilient. But I'm talking about resilience as it refers to you. 
the, the cool thing about the definition of resilience is it really refers to the ability to be stretched and snap back into form. So if we want to talk about something resilient, it's this and letting it go and it snaps back. It's not changed. It's original structure. There's nothing different about it. It is the exact same as if I were to pull on it. Now over time, if you do that long enough and you don't have self-care and you don't, you don't heal and you don't take time for yourself, that thing will become not resilient at some point and it will snap. So that's why self-care is important, pro tip. But resilience is the ability to bounce, snap back to form. And the reality was, when I pushed buttons most of my life, people eventually didn't snap back. They started to let that impact how they show, showed up the next day. And then, sure, maybe one day to the next, not a big difference. But you apply that over two months, that's a pretty big difference of how you're responding to me. You apply that over two years, that's a massive change. You have to snap back to form. In order to make a difference, in order to care, in order to help someone trans, tr or overcome and transcend their, their, their trauma, you have to snap back. Because there are, there are ways that you're gonna be stretching your role, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a teacher, whether you work with kids one, zero to five, they're gonna push your buttons. Kids are mean. Spoiler alert, kids are mean. My daughters hurt my feelings all day, every day. <laughs> but are you gonna let that change how you show up? Are you gonna let that change how you care for them? We have, us, we have to be resilient. One, because what does it matter if they're resilient if people in their life aren't modeling what it looks like in a good way? We think of resilience as this zero to 10 or like black or white, you have it, you don't. <laughs> It's always a, this positive, net positive skill. But resilience can be negative too. Resilience can be negative. The most resilient decision I could have ever made in my life, drop out of school at 16. By definition, that is a resilient decision. Because I'm, whatever's happening in my life, I'm not losing my, my drive to be successful. I just think my best decision is doing it on my own. So if people in my life aren't modeling what it looks like to show up every day committed to something in a positive way, how am I gonna do that? And how are you gonna match my resilience? Because us not showing up, like changing jobs, not showing up the same or better every single day, yeah, it's a job, whatever. But if kids don't do that, it's their life. It's their literal life. And so we have to be willing to match resilience. The final one is, Hey, hey now. <laughs> I didn't show this slide three times. Y'all done missed a couple opportunities. I appreciate it nonetheless. So the last one um, is empowerment. And since I got the awe, I'm just gonna skip past it. <laughs> is empowerment. And so when I decided to drop out of school that day, my high school coach followed me. My high school coach, before he ever talked about plans, ever talked about anything, this is what my coach said. And I'm literally on the ground weeping, sobbing, because I'm about to throw away my future. I was an honor roll student. I was a starter for varsity football, basketball for two years in a row, all conference as a sophomore. Like, I, I was a successful student, but I was ready to throw it all away because I wanted to like, put my hope in myself, in my own basket, putting all my eggs in my basket. So I'm crying because I knew like I'm throwing all that away, gonna go get my GD and figure it out. My coach comes up and before we ever talk about like next steps, my coach literally says, Galen, I can't imagine what you're going through right now. I don't have all the answers, but I do know that I want you to come live with us until we figure it out. That was a genuine awe, I appreciate that. <laughs> There's so much that we talked about yesterday for those that were here that uh, Dr. Tina was talking about where my coach is not trained in those things, but he did it in that moment for whatever reason, where he acknowledged, he was able to soothe, he made sure I was seen, he created this safe feeling, all in those moments to, to try to be a difference. And, and so I ended up going to my counselors, up. well, my immediate response to my coach was no thank you because I was a resilient kid, because I didn't trust people. My immediate response was no thank you. I went to my locker, was getting my stuff to literally walk out of the building, then my high school counselors, those pesky high school counselors that we talked about, found me and they're like, Galen, Galen, wait, we don't want you to go to class. 
And I'm like, cool, I don't want to go to class either. Just get out of my way so I can go. And they're like, no, we want you to come back to our office and so we can talk. Obviously, I didn't talk. I try to sneak out of the school at the end of the day at the bell to get out, go, disappear, not be seen, seen or heard from. My school coach, like a movie, was parked out front, door wide open, leaned against the car like, come on, Galen, get in. And I'm like, I am a terrible criminal. <laughs> like, why would I go out the front door? Like, that was a terrible decision. Honestly, it was probably me because I wanted to be found, but that's a different conversation. Um, I get in my coach, I go to his house, and for six-ish months, I'm a tenant in their home. Like, I'm not a part of their family. I don't really feel like I belong there, I'm a tenant. There was one night my eyes, so I would come home from school, go upstairs in my room, watch TV, do homework, come down, eat dinner with them, go back upstairs, stay there. Go to school the next day, that was the cycle. One night I came out and I was like, I'm gonna try to get some Cheetos. Try to sneak down, get some Cheetos, my coach is awake, Galen, come sit with us. Come in there and sit and, and literally sat in silence for five-ish minutes, felt like forever. And he broke the silence and he was like, Galen, I'm not trying to be your dad. I'm not trying to replace your dad. I'm not trying to be anything you don't want me to be. I'm just trying to give you a break that you haven't gotten. And when you're ready, let me know. And I just felt this calm come over me. I kind of sunk into the chair a little bit. And it was like, okay, I'll go wherever you ask me to. I'll do whatever you need me to do. And it created this consistency, this stability that didn't change my life overnight, but it changed it over time. And there was this element of empowerment where my coach was committed to helping me learn how to be successful in this safe, controlled environment. For me, most of my life felt like it was serious and for keeps, like it was life or death, decisions that I was making. But he gave me an opportunity to experience empowerment so that I could thrive at a time where he may not be around, so that I could thrive at a time where I was on my own. And that is the importance of the work that we're doing. We can be compassionate, authentic, resilient people, but if we're not empowering others to succeed when we can no longer serve them, then it's all for nothing. In my humble opinion, it's all for nothing. Because we're just kicking the can down the road, but how can we help people thrive and be successful? My coach passed away last February. And it was a really hard thing for me to process. One, because I didn't know how connected I was to him. I didn't, there was a lot of things that I didn't know. And there's a lot of things that were not talked about that were left unsaid and I really struggled and wrestled with it. But recently I was speaking to a group of kids and one of the kids asked me, he was like, am I still connected to my coach? He didn't know that my coach had passed away. And I was gonna immediately say, no, he passed away. But as I was responding, I kind of stopped and I was like, I am still in a relationship with my coach. The work that I get to do, the husband that I am, the father that I am, is all influenced and impacted by the empowerment that he put in my life. I, the work that I literally do is because of him. It's because of the ways that he empowered me and prepared me for a time to think of others beyond thinking of myself. Which, life being life or death, felt like it was a just me in this world, eat or be eaten kind of situation. So that kid that sat in the counselor's office and didn't talk for months on end is now doing this voluntarily, <laughs> right? I'm seeking out opportunities to do this because he empowered me in ways that changed my life. There's this quote, oh. Aww. See, that's a real awe. <laughs> that is a real awe. And I appreciate it, but these are my girls. And this is, this is what hope provided for me because Without people being the difference, without people showing up in my life at some of the more traumatic times, providing positive experiences to change who I am and who I was in that moment, allows me to do this. Allows me to break a cycle of trauma, a cycle of uh, adverse childhood experiences. This is what happens. You don't have to be a caregiver to do this. You don't have to be someone that's working directly with kids to change generations. This is the importance of caring. This is the importance of being the difference. When we value the work that we do and the role that we play, we change generations. That's them today. They're my girls. This is Lanaya on the left. She's three. She's the biggest three-year-old I've ever met in my life. And this is my apple-headed 
youngest baby, her name's Tatum. She's the one that has my head that I had as a baby. <laughs> and people all still. So those are my girls. And I was able to find belonging through care. Now, there's a quote that I want to leave you with. And it's this thing that, that, that really stopped me in my tracks when I, when I read it. It says, people change when they hurt enough, they have to. People change when they see enough, they're inspired to. People change when they learn enough that they want to. And people change when they receive enough that they're able to. I guarantee you the kids that you're serving, the ones you're, like the reason that you wake up and do the work that you do, I guarantee you that they've heard enough. I guarantee you that they've gone through enough hard things that they don't need to hurt enough that they have to change anymore. It's already here. That time is right now. But what does it look like for us to see our work in a way that we're committed to making sure that they see enough, that they're inspired to, that they learn enough, that they want to, and that they receive enough that they're able to? That's the work that we're in. So that they can, so uh, we're in the work of seeing, so that they can see, so they can learn, so they can receive. That is what we're doing. That is how we can be the difference, and that's how we can change generations. Thank you for the work you're doing.